So really quickly, we want to introduce someone to you that we've worked with for years. Her name is Jocelyn Rothschild. She's with the Crime Victims Compensation. Um, as most of you know, in May, we had a, uh, what did you write here? We had a shooting. Yeah, an incident of mass violence is what you said. Yes, I did. Um, and they have been, Crime Victims Comp has kind of been holding our hands through that whole process. Um, she's gonna kind of talk about what they do, um, what the application process for that incident is. It's a little different than what um, we would normally see with a, with a, you know, a crime that's not mass violence. Um, and, and, and even though we're not saying you have to fill out one for yourself, if you were there, but maybe you have friends or loved ones that might, were a part of that day that might need help filling it out. So Jocelyn, yes, you're up. Hello, can you hear me? So my name is Jocelyn and I am a case manager with the Crime Victims Compensation Program. The purpose of the Crime Victims Compensation Program is to assist victims of crime in paying for treatment for crime-related um, services. So that includes medical treatment, uh, mental health treatment. We, um, we have all sorts of sort of smaller pieces that we can help take care of um, for victims of crime. Um, and the way the program works, we are an eligibility-based program, which means there are certain requirements that have to be met. So there are four basic requirements. Um, it is a moderately complicated program, so I'm going to just kind of swing through the requirements really quick. Um, but the four basics are it has to have happened after 1986, because that's when the program was created. Uh, you have to have reported the incident to law enforcement within 72 hours, and we need an application within one year of the incident. However, in both of those cases, if there, are, if there is a good reason why that did not happen, um, and we will ask to find out what that reason might be, um, we can uh, find that a uh, good cause was met and move past those requirements. So the obvious and easiest example of that is minor children. We're not gonna hold them accountable for not reporting something to law enforcement or for not uh, submitting an application when they can't even sign the application until they're adults. Um, and then the last requirement is a, a preponderance of evidence. So it's the same level as probable cause. We have to be able to show that more likely than not, this person was the victim of a crime. Once we can do that, then um, we are able to offer up to $25,000 in medical and mental health services um, for crime related treatment. So we're going to look at that treatment. We're going to determine that it was related to that incident that that person was found eligible for, and then we're going to pay for it. Um, and again, that's up to $25,000 total. The mental health piece is initially limited to 2,500. Once we hit that point, we do have other pathways that we can take to get more mental health services. Um, so the, uh, the difference, I guess, between, um, a, a mass violence incident is that when there is a mass violence incident um, and a request is made for our assistance to the governor's office, we can come in, we have a, a very, very abbreviated mass violence application. Um, it's a, a single page. Um, and as long as we can confirm that the person who is completing that application or that that application is completed for, um, is a victim of that crime, and we, we lean on our law enforcement offices to do that. They tell us, okay, this is what happened in the situation, and um, here's who was a victim. As long as we can show that, then that victim is found eligible for benefits. When we were here in May, um, I believe we were here four, maybe five days after the incident, and within two to three days after that, we had started pushing out um, eligibility decisions. We had taken care of that within a week. Um, that's not our normal process. Our normal process takes some time um, unless we have a request from the governor's office and we were, are responding to a mass event. We are not an emergency program. However, um, in that case, we do have the specialized application and can uh, respond in that way. And so um, we can push those applications out as fast as possible. The, the purpose of that is so that people can get treatment as quickly as possible. Um, we, we do not want people to um, hold off when they need treatment because they can't afford it and they don't know what we're going to do. 
Uh, so our general application is a five page application. It asks for lots of information. Um, and it uh, is a process. We get the application in, it gets entered into our database. At that point, we are requesting law enforcement reports, information from prosecutors' offices, um, sometimes things like medical records, if we've gotten um, bills in already, that kind of thing, um, in order to make a determination on that preponderance of evidence. So sometimes it is a, a time process. It takes some time. Uh, the other thing that our program does um, is we pay for sexual assault exams that occur in the state of Idaho. So those happen either through the general five page application or those happen through a single page application um, that is filled out for that purpose. Um, mostly that information is just for you to keep in mind. If you um, are in contact with someone who has experienced a sexual assault and needs an exam, but paying for it is a problem, they don't pay for it. Crime Victims Compensation pays for those exams, okay? Um, all, of, all of this information is available on our website, um, and we do have a, a table out front that has um, materials. We have applications. Um, we can talk you through what you need, um, and our cards are out there. And I would strongly encourage you, um, if you feel like you need an application and you have questions, um, to at least come get a card or one of our... Um, our uh, brochures or tabletop cards that just sort of have a breakdown of the program and ways to get in contact with us. Um, if you are a provider who often works with people who may benefit from our program, I would strongly encourage you to come get some information. Um, you never know when, when it's going to come in handy and when you need to have it. Um, so we work hard to um, to assist victims as much as we possibly can within the bounds of our program, um, to find people eligible for benefits, to then pay for those benefits and um, get things taken care of in as, as quick or timely manner as possible. We do require under the law that if you have some sort of health insurance, Blue Cross, um, Aetna, Medicaid, any of those things, um, that that does have to be billed first. So you're going to want to go see somebody who can bill your insurance and then bill, ha have them bill the rest of it to the post. So that process requires just contacting me, letting me know, and then I can, I can work all of those steps. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is sometimes using your health insurance is, is not, or your victim using their health insurance is not the, um, the healthiest or the safest way to go. In that case, I just need to know that and I can work around it um, because our goal is to do everything we can to make victims whole. So um, again, I would strongly encourage you to come get some information. We'll be out there till about two uh, and then we have to drive back to Boise. So uh, um, we, are, we are based out of Boise, but we have three case managers who cover the entire state. So someone, is, someone in our office is an expert in the area where you are located. Um, most probably that expert is me. I don't know how comfortable that makes you, but um, I am the case manager for this region. So um, anything located in region seven, um, I've been doing this for a while and um, I can probably help you with what you need. And if I can't, I know people who can't. So um, I, I think that's it. Thank you. I'm gonna have um, Jackie Briggs with Courageous Survival and Johnny Yu. I'm gonna say you, cause I, I'm gonna mess up your last name if I say it that's actually. Fair. That's fair. So Jackie Briggs, um, she is the co-founder or she's the founder and director of Courageous Survival. Um, she's a mental health advocate, first responder and USMC veteran spouse. Jackie is also mother to four beautiful young women, two of which are suicide attempt survivors. Currently, Idaho is in the battle of ranking our state, uh, is in a battle ranking our state 50th in the U.S. for mental health and wellness resources. Um, these are not just statistics to her. Unfortunately, it's personal. Jackie will be sharing her passion to connect individuals and families with the resources crucial to not only surviving, but thriving. And then Johnny Yu is the founder and director of an intensive healing therapy, Idaho Horse Therapy, and USA Reboot Resort. 
Um, he, he's a US Army veteran, professional bull rider, professional musician, school teacher, and for the past 15 years, a certified equine specialist and mindfulness teacher. Johnny, you do all the things. Um, he'll be teaching an interactive breathwork class today. Um, and let's welcome Jackie and Johnny. I'm gonna take this off here for a second so I can walk around a little bit. So Ashley did a great job of, with the intro, so um, I don't have to go into as many details, but what I, everything that we went through as a family, even though my husband is a veteran, Marine Corps, as well as a first responder for almost 28 years, um, thank goodness he's gonna be retiring next year, we have major trauma that came into our home. Um, it was more stressful for him to be at home than it was for him to go to work because we adopted. And so our trauma came in a different way, but a lot of first responders, a lot of veterans, a lot of people who are exposed to trauma, that trauma travels through the family. Spouses and significant others are the front line for that, but we are also impacted vicariously by the trauma that we bring home. Even if you think you're not bringing it home, you are bringing it home. So um, our family was impacted. Um, we adopted two girls that had a lot of trauma and that's where our trauma came from. I ended up with four girls that struggled with major mental health issues and were suicidal, two of which are suicide attempt survivors. Our youngest when um, in 2006, <clears throat> excuse me, 2015 um, with her suicide attempt, it was four days before we knew she was going to live at St. Luke's. And then she was at Intermountain Psychiatric um, Juvenile Facility and I will be eternally grateful to them that they kept her alive because we knew that she would not be with us if she got out. She told us she would not fail again. And so we fought and fought for resources for her. I was not willing to give up on my daughter. I was not willing to just cave, even though there was lots of times that I felt like I just wanted to curl up in a puddle on the floor. And so I fought and fought and I'm a person of faith. So whatever faith you are, I encourage you to you know, hang on to that but that gave me the strength to continue to go and to fight for resources. And the Lord gave us a miracle and we ended up getting her into a facility back in, um, back in the Midwest. And she was there for eight weeks. It was $2,400 a day. Yeah. Huge miracle. Our portion ended up being only 2,500 because we had three other hospital bills that we were paying off. Plus my husband had got a pacemaker four months before that because of all the stress. Um, so when I say that we're here to connect you with resources, for mental health and wellness, I've lived it. Idaho is ranked 50th, but I really believe with all the work that I've done over the last five years and all the people that I've met, um, that there is a lot more resources that are out there and available. People just don't know about them. So after traveling nationally and doing two-day mental health and wellness trainings across the country, um, I realized we were losing too many here in Idaho. And this is my family because I'm a native to Idaho. And you can go ahead, sorry, I forgot to say this, go to the next slide. Um, so that's my husband and my daughters. I have four of them um, and I have a granddaughter, my daughter who we almost lost. She's a mama now and my granddaughter is gonna be three. So that's her right there in the picture with us. Um, anyway, so this is very personal to me. And so we started seeing a huge rise in suicide. Idaho is ranked high. We lost an officer at my husband's agency, Ada County Sheriff's Office. One of my best friends lost his son as a Meridian officer that took his life three years ago on duty. Um, and so there was seven first responders that we lost in about a two year period, just within the Treasure Valley to suicide. Plus all the veterans, we're losing 22 veterans a day to suicide. That is over 8,000 veterans we are losing every year. That is too many. And so, yep, exactly. One is too many. And so that's just almost unfathomable, you know, when you look at those numbers. And so that's what I wanted to do is I wanted to create a way that we could connect people with the resources because there is amazing resources out there. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about what we do with Courageous Survival. Go ahead to the next. So this is what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking about our mission, our peer support teams, um, the value of sharing your story. 
um, enhanced peer support teams, the available resources, what post-traumatic stress injury is. If you guys are not familiar with PTSI, um, I'll be talking about that. Um, the importance of self-care. And then we're going to go on to Johnny and actually share one of those resources with you. It's a very powerful tool, simple breath work that you can do that will help you to learn to re regulate your autonomic nervous system. Go ahead into the next. To the next. So our mission um, is to connect our Idaho everyday heroes with mental health and wellness and tangible tools for building resilience. Our hope is that all first responders, veterans, and their families can learn to recognize the signs of trauma exposure and post-traumatic stress injuries in themselves and in others, and then have the courage to reach out for help. Because you know what, you guys, you are worth it. Your life matters and you matter. And I know this is kind of a unique situation because most community members have no idea what kind of trauma that our first responders and our veterans have been exposed to. Most therapists don't have an idea if they are not specialized and know about, you know, having trauma informed and all kinds of specific for PTSD for first responders and veterans, most counselors two minutes into the session are needing their own darn counselor. And so that's the truth. I see, see some heads shaking. You guys know what I'm talking about. So you guys have a really unique situation here in Rigby because of the school shooting. You as a community have been impacted by trauma at such a higher level than most people understand and get. And so we wanna make sure that you guys have the resources as well. So we were invited to come and talk about what we do, but we also, a lot of the resources in these resource guides, they specialize in first responders and veterans, but they also treat civilians. So those resources can be available for you as well. Um, and to make sure that you guys get the best resources. And you guys have so many phenomenal resources here um, in Eastern Idaho, it is amazing. Um, I'm a native Idahoan. I was born in Coeur d'Alene, raised in Star and Boise in the Treasure Valley area. And I have a very special place in my heart for our rural communities because a lot of people don't realize, even first responders, they're like, what, what do first responders see in rural communities? Eh, they never have anything. They never see what the big city um, first responders see. That is baloney because the first responders here in you guys' area, they have less access to resources their backup is further away. And when they go to a call, when they go to a school shooting, when they go to an accident, when they go to a domestic, it's their cousin or their fifth grade teacher, you know, or a friend. And so that personal level connection to the calls that they're going impacts them even more. And so that is our passion is to make sure that we're getting to every area of the state. So our mission is specifically Idaho, um, because that's where I live, right? But we have other people that we're helping in other states as well. Go ahead to the next screen. So I'm not gonna be able to play a video for you, but I wanna encourage you guys, um, if you're online and you're listening to please go online. Um, at some point we have on our website, we have a page that is testimonials. I have first responders and veterans that are sharing their story. And the power of the story is so incredible. When you have a Marine Corps veteran who's a SWAT cop and a canine officer, you know, the toughest of the tough, right? Sharing their story or Cameo, who is gonna share with you, a paramedic, um, sharing her story. Her dad, dad's a cop, she was right here. She's an Idaho girl. Um, I don't know if you guys remember, we lost a Boise officer about 23 years ago. Mark Stahl was killed in downtown Boise. And she was actually in the car on a ride along with her dad. And she was involved in that. Bullets were falling at her feet um, in the passenger seat. And her dad was one of the shooters that took out the gunman. And she changed her course in her life. She was a young adult going to college and she became a, a paramedic. Um, but all of the trauma that she had been exposed to throughout her life, um, and then everything that she was exposed to during her job as a paramedic impacted her greatly. And one day she had a breaking point. And you know, I know the officer that is my best friend's dad um, our Meridian officer that we lost, he kept saying before he took his life, he kept telling his family, it feels like my brain is broken. Because you know what, when you're exposed to trauma, it changes your brain. It is a mental injury that can happen, whether it's repeated exposure to trauma or intense exposure to trauma. And I'll talk a little bit about that a little bit later. Um, but I just kind of wanted to give you a kind of an offer. Just don't hit any. Um, we're not going to get a chance to watch the video. So please go and watch the stories because these guys 
it is so impactful. Um, I know we've had several of the speakers talking about the stigma surrounding suicide and stuff, but when you got, you know, like I said, a Marine Corps veteran, a paramedic, you know, a police officer who's still active duty. Um, one of our peer support members is an AMPA police officer. Her story is incredible. The fact that they're sharing their stories and they're still working and they've learned to build resilience, they've gotten the help that they need is such an incredible miracle that that should give you guys hope and sharing your stories is important. Um, sometimes it can really unlock the keys to someone else's prison when you're willing to share your story. Obviously you need to do it in a safe place um, and stuff and you need to feel, feel surrounded and supported when you do that. Um, but it's so powerful because you're like, wow, it's okay to not be okay. It's okay to realize that mental health is not a huge stigma that once you're broken, um, there's nothing you can do. And you know, there's no hope. So please, I hope that's your takeaway from this, that there is hope and there are things that you can do. It doesn't mean it's gonna erase the trauma. It doesn't mean that you're not gonna have hard days, but there are tools and resources out there that can help you get through this. Go ahead. And that was the video. So we'll go ahead and skip that one. So I wanna introduce, um, Part of what we did um, when we started, I had no idea how this was gonna evolve, but we've had so many different divine appointments of all these different agencies and organizations and people coming together. Um, I knew when I started meeting with people, you know, we meet right now, we meet with three to 10 different first responders, veterans or their spouses each week um, to help them connect with resources. But I had no idea what was gonna happen when we started doing this and how many people were willing to help. Um, and it grew from, I realized when I'm meeting with a veteran, I need to have a veteran as their peer. You know, if I'm meeting with a spouse, I need to have a spouse. Um, I'm a spouse, but I'm also not a first responder and I'm not a veteran. So I'm not a peer. I don't understand the level of where you've been. And so that was important to make sure that we had peers for you guys as well. And so we have some incredible people. And if you are on the peer support team, um, go ahead and stand up for a second. I wanna introduce them. Um, and if you are the Bonner County chaplains, these guys drove down um, their first responder chaplains up in North Idaho. So if you're one of those chaplains, go ahead and stand up as well, because we do a lot of collaboration and partnership with them, as well as the law enforcement chaplains of Idaho, which are located right here in Idaho Falls. So where are you guys? So these guys are incredible resources. Um, and I encourage you guys to reach out to them. We have a, um, a call line, it's not a crisis line, but we can get back with you within 24 hours. We are not a crisis resource, but we can connect you with resources if we need to, if it is a crisis. Um, there's you know, crisis lines on the, um, on the website and stuff like that, but these guys have lived it. They have sat in your seat and they know what it's like. Um, my best friend right there, she lost her stepson just a few months ago to suicide. He was lost to suicide while he was in prison not because he'd done something really bad, but because his mental health issues got out of control and he did not get the help that he needed. And so all these people, they have all been touched. They've all been served, um, served their communities um, and impacted personally. And so we have actually 29 members of our peer support team, active duty first responders, retired first responders, military and veterans, as well as spouses or significant others. And we're working on partnering with different agencies and organizations across the state, like the Bonner County Chaplains, Law Enforcement Chaplains of Idaho, so we can fill in the gaps and really get the people the support that they need. Go ahead. So here's some fun things. We get to learn about the resources, so we know about them. So when you need those resources, we can say, yeah, that's a really cool organization, or that's a really great training. Um, so we've gone razor riding with Wishes for Warriors. Um, to, they bring in combat wounded veterans from across the US and take them riding here in Idaho because we have such a cool place to live, right? Um, we went down on Hell's Canyon and went jet boating with Team River Runner. They take veterans and community members out um, and they do kayaking and whitewater rafting and stuff like that. Um, connected with Johnny with the equine therapy. We were at the Back the Blue Idaho rally and we went bowling together. We do stuff together as a team to support each other. Um, there's 29 members right now. We've got several that are waiting to join, but we also have four clinicians um, 
that are our clinical advisors. And one of those is located right here in, um, in Idaho Falls area. And she is phenomenal. She's a great resource for you guys. Some of our members are here um, as well. Um, Bart Whiting with Idaho Falls Police Department and Brad Landis, he's retired from Idaho Falls. They're here and they're a part of our team. We've got one of our clinical advisors up north. Her husband was the officer in 2004 that was shot in the face and died several times, came back from that and he is a walking quadriplegic. He's a miracle. She went on, she's a veteran, she's a paramedic or EMT, excuse me. Um, and she is a mental health um, psychiatric nurse and they are incredible resources for us. So there's a lot of people that we're building this network. So if you know of resources or you are a resource, please let us know, or if you wanna get involved, um, we'd love to have you involved. Go ahead. So within the resource guide, um, and this is downloadable, um, for you guys on the website. And they're also going to email you the copy of the PDF, but it's a 20 page resource guide. And in it, there are resources from um, everything from crisis lines that are specific to first responders and veterans to the mobile crisis teams, which all anybody can use. Um, each of those for all the regions of the state, they're all functioning and working. And that is a mobile crisis team that can come out to your home or wherever you're at, and they can help you deal with the situation that's going on and help assess does this person, does my child need to be you know, admitted? Is this person a danger? What kind of resources do we need? Um, those guys are great resources. Um, specific treatments, um, therapists that have been vetted that really know what they're doing, treatment programs. Um, some of you guys got to hear a little bit from the um, Brothers in Healing. They're both alumni from Deer Hollow. When I was down doing a two-day mental health and wellness training in Orlando, Florida, we had community leaders and first responders come up from Martin County, which is where the Parkland school shooting was, used to be the deadliest school shooting um, in the US mass shooting before the Pulse nightclub happened and before Vegas happened. Um, but it is a very rural area. We all didn't know that because it's on the national news, right? But it is so rural um, that they have like one clinician, um, one psych psychiatrist in the whole county of Martin County. And even to this day, those community members, those school leaders, those students, those parents, those first responders, they are still struggling big time. And so they came up and I got to meet some of them and they're like, oh my gosh, these resources are incredible. We had no idea, but they knew about Deer Hollow because Deer Hollow is one of the best in the nation for first responders and veterans. Johnny works um, um, with special forces and department of defense and stuff. And he's been doing a lot of work with them and they USA Reboot Resort was out of Louisiana until COVID hit. Um, and so instead of waiting for that to get back up and running, he's gonna go ahead and get that stuff going here in Idaho. Um, but there's just incredible resources, trainings. Um, you guys did the QPR earlier. Um, we're working with those ladies from Center of Hope and Andra, um, Andra and Nancy, and they have a grant so that that QPR training is available for you guys. And we'll be able to start offering that online. And I run into so many people, they're like, well, I'm not a first responder, but my niece took their life a few weeks ago and now my kids are struggling. So what kind of resources do you have? And so those are tangible resources that you guys can connect with. So I encourage you to check those out. Okay, go ahead. So some of the resources, I kind of mentioned some of them already. Um, for example, in the Boise area, we have um, in Nampa, there's a place called Elevate Mind Body Studios. And when I would travel across the country, part of what my role was is to look for resources like them. Um, they have float pods, wellness cocoon sauna, red light, pain light, massage chairs, Himalayan salt room with halo generator. These types of resources for your mental and physical health are so phenomenal. Um, and that's where we operate because that business is extremely generous um, and they have a real heart to serve not just first responders and veterans, although on the 11th of every month, they do a, fr a free service and people get to come in. And then we get to meet with people down there, do a VIP tour and give them a pass that's worth over $200 of services that they can try floating. They can try massage chairs, red light, all of that. Um, and so I would went in places like Houston and Orlando and Seattle. Guess what? I was had a hard time finding, I could never find anything like Elevate anywhere across the US where we went. And I didn't go everywhere, but went into some pretty major cities. We were lucky if we were able to find a float center. And if you've not familiarized yourself with the sensory deprivation pod, they are phenomenal. Um, I had one veteran, he was on 17 different medications 
and two suicide attempts, totally angry, withdrawn all the time. He went to a program called Save a Warrior, a nonprofit that helps first responders and veterans. Had 1,600 first responders and veterans go through that in nine years and only lost four to suicide. He went to that, came home, started floating, found Elevate, and floated for two times a month. He is off all his meds. He is re-engaged with his family. He just got married on 9-11. He's going back to school. He's working full time. He's a totally different person. And it's because he got connected with the right resources that he needed. Um, but what is super cool and why I'm talking about them is because you guys have a place like that. They don't have floats yet. I'm hoping they'll bring them, but awesome relaxation. If you guys have not heard of it, they have one room has like 24 massage chairs in it. They have red light, blue light, green light, PEMF beds, I mean, this place is phenomenal and it's an Ammon. It's right here for you guys to use. Um, those resources are so incredible to help you, not just when you are feeling stressed and in crisis, but to get ahead of it, right? Because we don't want to keep pulling dead bodies out of the river. We want to get up river and figure out what we can do to maintain our own mental health and wellness, as well as that of our family and our friends. And so the more that you can find resources like that, that can help you maintain it's, it's awesome. So it's really cool that you guys have that here. It's called awesome relaxation. It's like a H H H, you know, then the rest <laughs> kind of a play on words. <laughs> so, um, like I said, they're, uh, they're right by the Walmart in Ammon. I came over in May and we did a, a week long training for suicide prevention and trauma focused mental health and wellness. And I was looking for float centers and I was like, oh my gosh, they don't have a float center but the one that you guys had closed and somebody told me about that, actually Sheriff Sam Hulse, um, he, they actually donated, awesome donated two massage chairs to their sheriff's office and they have them at different locations. So when officers, you know, come in, they can use the massage chairs and stuff like that. So, and this place is open 24 seven. You can get a membership and you can go in and you can use it 24 seven. It's pretty cool. Um, go ahead to the next screen. So some of our other partners are nonprofits like Brothers in Healing that came and spoke today. Those guys are, um, if you guys missed them, there are two school resource officers that were involved in some pretty major incidents, including um, school shooting. And they formed a nonprofit to help um, first responders. And they also help schools because they have a real heart for kids and families. They have some anti-bullying messages, some suicide prevention stuff. They've done some powerful stuff with schools and with kids. Um, and so I thought that they would be a great resource for you guys. So I'm so grateful that they were able to come and present. Um, they help to provide um, funding for first responders and veterans and their families. Um, 911 at Ease is a nonprofit that just came to Idaho. They were in California first. They will pay for the first responder, their spouse, and their kids to get counseling free. No attachment to EAP or insurance. And that's really a big deal to a lot of, for example, law enforcement they want to know that it's anonymous because um, there's still a lot of stigmas that have to be broken down um, of once that person is like, hey, yeah, I'm struggling, then they get written off and they're like, okay, they're broken. We need to, you know, put them in a different position or, you know, let them go. Unfortunately, we've had a lot of people that have been let go um, because they didn't get the resources that they need and they weren't supported by the agencies um, that they've given their lives for. So, um, anyway, there's a lot of great resources like that. I talked about Save a Warrior, Project Welcome Home Troops. They have a, a free breathwork class and that is community members can also take that. You guys can connect with them online. It's a powerful tool. Go ahead to the next screen. And I'm just giving you guys kind of an overview of some of the really cool resources, but there's a ton of them. Um, there's four pages in our resource guide and we're updating it every quarter as we go to another area of the state we are updating it. We just added nine therapists here in the um, Idaho Falls area that have specialty in trauma. Um, so we're committed to that. Other community partnerships that we have is with NAMI Idaho, the American Legion, the Idaho Suicide Prevention Hotline, um, Code 3 to 1 Retired Law Enforcement, and we partnered for Center of Hope when we came over here in the Department of Health and Welfare, and they are incredible resources. Um, Amber and Mike, you guys from the NAMI, can you guys stand up for a second? Um, Amber is the young and well coordinator for NAMI and um, Mike is the president emeritus. I don't know where he's at, um, but they have 
incredible resources. It's a national organization and they, they run the Idaho chapter, but they have support groups. They have Zoom groups from families to peers to all of that. And so that they are a great resource. The American Legion, we're partnering with um, Abe. Can you stand up for a second? He's the adjutant for the state of Idaho for the American Legion. And they have an incredible program, um, a one more day program to help veterans that are struggling with suicide and also to train our goal is to help them develop peer support teams and veteran crisis teams at every post, 99 posts across the state of Idaho. Um, and one of the first trainings we got to do with them partnering here was here in Idaho Falls in May. And it was so cool because we had veterans that were like young all the way through veterans that were like 82 that went through the two day suicide prevention training or came to the QPR training because they're so committed that they don't wanna see any more of their comrades lives be lost. Um, so thank you guys for what you're doing as well. Um, the QPR, like I said, those resources are right here. You guys can probably go to some of their stuff in person as well as online. The ETIP, um, that's a great class for emergency responders um, to go specifically teaching you because you can't stop the initial trauma. You can save the lives of people potentially sometimes and you can help the victims but you cannot stop the initial trauma. But what you can do is you can learn skills so that it can help mitigate some of the post-traumatic stress injury that impacts you that at that moment, as well as down the road. Um, so that's a really great class for them. And then I don't know if you guys are familiar, but in um, Boise area, um, and then they have one in, in Twin Falls, it's called Joining Forces Task Force for Treasure Valley Veterans. And it started um, 12 years ago when there was an incident that happened with a veteran who had a breakdown and disassociated and thought he was in combat, got into a shootout with police. But when he was in the jail, the um, chief of police and a veteran advocate came and met and got him the resources that he needed. And they started meeting every week. And we still meet 12 years later, there is 40 to 60 of us that meet once a month from different veterans organizations to help surround the veterans in the community with the resources that they need. It's super cool, all these collaborations that are happening. Go ahead to the next screen. Um, and I wanted to point out, um, where is the Upper Valley Child Advocates in the room? Okay, we got one, we got some more. Um, you guys know who they are. You're here, they're, they're running the event. They put this together and East Idaho Public Health. Are you guys in here as well? Um, this is one, this symposium is one of the best trainings, mental health trainings I have seen ever come to a rural area. Um, these guys did a phenomenal job of putting this together and of serving your community over the last several months, especially, I mean, day in and day out, but really they've stepped up and they've taken the first responder role um, over the last four months. And so um, they are incredible resources for you guys, as well as the crime victims um, compensation program. And I couldn't quite hear everything she was saying, but Kimber and her team, they are the first in Idaho to make sure that the first responders were designated as victims of the school shooting as well. And that's huge so that they can get the help that they need. And so it is incredible that anyone um, who is impacted by that school shooting is able to get mental health help and therapy for free for the rest of your life. Those resources are incredible. And so please take advantage of them. Um, faith is a big thing too. I'm a native Idaho girl, right? I grew up here. Faith is a big thing to a lot of us. And so I know a lot of you guys um, are from the faith community here. Tap into those resources, you know, make sure that you are connecting because that faith can really help you get through. Um, and that's a big part of, I love the fact that they brought faith leaders in and that they had a track for faith leaders because oftentimes as a faith leader, I mean, prayer is a powerful and I don't want to take anything away from our awesome God, right? Because my daughter is alive because God owns the cattle on a thousand hills and we got a miracle. We couldn't have even mortgaged our home for $143,000, what it cost my daughter to go to treatment, but we got a miracle because God moved mountains for our family, but not everybody gets that. And I want to I want to change that. And I want Idaho to start leading the way instead of being always dead last. Um, so your faith, connect with your faith leaders. And a part of that was to help get the faith leaders the tools that they need as well. 
um, so that as they're helping people in their congregations, they know what resources to connect people with because prayer is powerful. But the fact that we have to partner with people who know what they're doing with trauma and mental health professionals, there's nothing wrong with doing that. We have to start breaking those stigmas down to break those barriers. Go ahead. Um, and I'm going to just be quick about this because I need to get moving on. But in 2019, there was a big push and we got through a bill through, for workers comp for post-traumatic stress injury for first responders. And it has a sunset clause. It's going to go away in 2023 if we don't get that back in. They're collecting data right now. They're watching what's going on with it. But it allows first responders to get the help that they need through workers comp, which is huge because in the past, when that shooting happened like 23 years ago, when Mark Stahl died, there was nine officers that were involved in that. One other officer who's on our team, he was shot and he was bleeding out on the pavement. He's the only one that qualified for workers comp to get help for PTSD. The rest of the officers that were there, you had to have a physical injury in order to get mental health help, which that's crazy, right? Um, and so that is available now through workers comp. So that's really cool. You can learn more about that on our website. The law is on there. If you're a clinician, what you need to know so that you can chart, because we know that PTSD is cumulative, but for workers comp, it has to be tied to a specific incident. It can be the last straw that broke the camel's back, but it has to be an incident that happened after July 1st, 2019. So Deer Hollow came up and we did a training for clinicians to teach clinicians how you guys need a chart, what you can do to help your first responders know so that they can get the benefits that they need. Because right now, 50% of law enforcement's getting denied, 75% of fire, 67% of EMS are being denied through workers' comp of things that should be covered. And so we're working with that. We're working with attorneys that specialize um, that can help as well. Go ahead to the next screen. So I've been talking a lot about PTSD, PTSI. So post-traumatic stress injury, and I know you guys got to hear um, Matthew earlier talk about some of this, but it is an actual injury that can happen to your brain when you're exposed to trauma and or you know repeatedly or intense trauma, it actually can cause your amygdala to shrink, your hippocampus to change sizes, your neural pathways to reroute. And so it is an actual mental injury, physical injury that happens in your brain. And so if you have a broken arm, are you going to ignore it and just hope that it gets, you know, that it heals somehow? No, you're going to get help for it. So why wouldn't we get help um, for this as well for mental injuries? Um, and I heard him say earlier too, and this is really important, is that trauma is trauma. Do not compare because we've all had stuff that we've gone through and our body keeps the score. And even as children, we think, oh, well, there's a lot of us who've had childhood trauma. Do you guys know? like 70 to 80% of first responders or veterans, they've had some kind of major childhood trauma in their life that has molded them to become who they are, to be the helpers, to be the rescuers. Childhood trauma impacts people and children are resilient and they bounce back, but they carry that trauma with them. And so if you don't get them the help that they need and the resources that can impact them later in life um, as well as currently. And so please make sure, don't wait. The sooner that you can connect with those resources, the better. We, one of our therapists here, she actually, after a first responder had a really bad incident with a child death, that, ther that first responder came directly to her office right after the incident and did some accelerated resolution therapy. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that or EMDR, um, but you have 15 therapists here in Idaho Falls area in Eastern Idaho that are certified in that. And it can help mitigate and reroute those neural pathways immediately um, from that trauma and helped it with the triggers and stuff. She wrote a grant for 15 of them to get um, trained in that. And the behavioral health board here that Sam Hulse and several others sit on, they approved that. And so you guys have those resources here. Um, some people can go to the same situation, the same call, and it can impact them totally different. So stop comparing, you know, oh, I don't have it so bad as so-and-so you know, or my first responders, they'll be like, don't put me in the same category as a veteran because I didn't go serve in combat. And then the veterans will turn around and say, I'm not in the same category as a first responder because I got to come home and I don't have to live it every day and I get a break from it. So we're all from the same cloth and trauma impacts us all. Go ahead. So 
recognize the symptoms and the signs, hypervigilance, insomnia, anxiety, depression, isolation, agitation. My grandfather was a World War II veteran. He came home from the war. They called him Mean Gene. Guess what? PTSD and depression looks like in men, it often comes out as anger and rage. And so that's a huge thing that we need to recognize. But the good news is that our brains are neuroplastic and just the way that trauma can reroute the neural pathways, it can't dissolve the trauma completely, right? We can never get rid of that. It becomes a part of who we are, but it can help mitigate some of the effects and the ways that we get, you know, get triggered or not. Um, and being able to sleep and being able to function. Um, so I encourage you guys to continue to look for those resources. Go ahead to the next screen. So Emotional Survival for Law Enforcement, that is one of the best books um, ever for first responders that's been written. Those bags over there that are on the, um, if you guys are wondering what that is, that is one of the tools and resources that a nonprofit called Honoring the Heroes puts together. It's over $200 worth of resources on PTSD, um, depression, anxiety, um, specific to first responders and veterans. The green ones are for fire and EMS, the black ones are for law enforcement and dispatch. And they're only a hundred bucks and you guys can get them yourself. But if you are a first responder here in Jefferson County, our goal with coming was to make sure, especially with it being rural, we want every single one of you guys to have one of those backpacks. So please come and see us. Um, and we will be also delivering them over the next few weeks as well, because we want every single person to have one of those in their hands. Um, so thank you, Honoring the Heroes, and thank you to all of the donors who've been uh, able to provide those. Um, but that is a book that is in there, Emotional Survival for Law Enforcement. And if you go ahead and go to the next screen. Um, I just want to show you a couple of the excerpts from it. I had been married to my husband. Gosh, we're 31 years now. I can't remember. It was like six years ago. We went to Dr. Gil Martin's um, workshop that Ada County Sheriff brought him. And we had had three officer involved shootings in the Treasure Valley within a 36 hour period. And my husband's team was involved in one of them. And it was perfect timing, divine bland. And we went to that the next week. And that is one of the books that helped save my marriage. Um, my husband doesn't necessarily know that, but, um, <laughs> but for me as a spouse to be able to step back and realize how can my husband be so high functioning at work and on his job. And I mean, he does his job 210%. He is incredible. And then come home, you know, and I know a lot of other first responders and veteran families as well have experienced that. I'm sure probably some of you, like the Upper Valley Child Advocates, you're working 16 hour days, you come home and you're just like, boom. And you're just, you gotta disconnect. You gotta, you know, download. And so when I started to learn to not take that personal, that it wasn't because my husband didn't love me or that he was angry with me if he was snappy that day, it was probably because he was on a really bad call that day. You know, so it's important to be able to step back and to learn how trauma can affect us and stop reacting to the people in our lives and around us and kind of step back from that and recognize that. And then we can help ourselves as well as that person. Go ahead to the next screen. The other thing that I will encourage you, and this applies to everybody, he uses the example of a cop, but every first responder, anybody can learn from this, right? Is that in your life, you need to have a balance. If all your friends are cops, you need to do something about that. You know, if you're a teacher or you're a firefighter and you're just hanging out with firefighters or veterans, you need to expand that because it's so important to have more than just being a cop or being a firefighter. You know, you start out your career coaching little league, going to church, being involved with different things, hobbies and stuff like that. And the more that hypervigilance cycle takes over, the more that you're like on that adrenaline rush and then home adrenaline and taking overtime. And you're just going through that cycle and you don't have time for this. You have to make time for these different things and to be connected in the community and with your family. Go ahead to the next screen and have fun. So this is one of my best friends ever. He's the father of the Meridian officer that took his life. He's on our team but we also go do a lot of fun together. It's been hard and it's been rough. These, the pain is real. 
but it doesn't mean that it precludes us from having fun. So I wanna make sure that you guys understand that in the midst of it, you can experience joy, you can experience peace, doesn't take away from your trauma, but you gotta take time to do self-care. You gotta have, take time to laugh and have fun. That was after we went dirt bike riding. <laughs> we were all dirty and his hair was sticking up. We were being goofy. Um, the next screen, go ahead. These are some of the things that I do. I'm an Idaho girl. I love my mountains. So I love riding dirt bikes out in the um, back country, spending time with my friends, painting, going hiking and backpacking with my daughter and my granddaughter. So what do you guys do? What do you guys do for self-care? Has anybody here ha heard from about awesome? Have you been there? The awesome relaxation place? Nobody? There's Okay, right there. There's a first responder that I just heard about last night that, that they had been having trouble sleeping and had a lot of trauma and finally broke down and went to awesome. And he's like, I'm sleeping at night now and he's feeling better. You know, it's pretty cool. Can I get two people to share what they do for self-care? I know you go to awesome. Anybody else? Gardening, gardening is good. Getting in and working in the dirt with your hands. It's very therapeutic. Somebody else. Oh, outdoor kayaking. Oh, outdoors and hiking. Somebody on the chat, outdoors and hiking. You and the, the blonde, sorry. Kayaking, kayaking, cool. Okay, is there a first responder in the room here from this area? Can I call on you? What are you doing for self-care? Fly fishing. Okay, good, good. Um, not overtime, right? You guys, self-care is not overtime so that you can go buy more stuff. <laughs> exactly. And what she said for those of you on the chat is that what she noticed about the, the slides is that in the slides, I have quite a few of them are I'm with friends and family and self-care can be going and spending time with them um, as well. That's really important. And I'm a very outgoing person. My husband's slides would be, um, he's more introverted. And so he'd much rather be up at the ranch in the mountains by, you know, himself. I'm a people person, but I also like my private time. So anyway, I want to encourage you guys think about that. Keep that in mind. What are you doing for self-care? And I have some fun self-care stuff for the upper valley, I'll give them some treats later. Um, go ahead to the next screen. So I know that was kind of a lot of information that I gave you, trying to shorten it down so that we can keep on schedule. Um, our peer support teams are available. We are available, reach out to us. If we don't know of a resource, we'll find somebody who can find a resource for you guys. I'm gonna continue working with Upper Valley, with East Idaho Public Health, with Andra and Center for Hope and Nancy and NAMI here so that we guys can support you guys and surround your community with the resources that you need because one life lost is too many. So one of the things that we are going to teach you right now is a breathwork technique. It is a powerful breathwork technique. You don't have to participate in it, but I do encourage you. This is so powerful. Johnny, if you wanna go ahead and come up, um, I wanna introduce him. These are some things that are involved in his program. He's done a lot of things as you heard his bio, but his passion right now is intensive healing therapy. And so he started that. And after traveling across the nation, his program is one of the most powerful programs because it takes all of the modalities that I've seen are the most helpful for people struggling with PTSD, depression, anxiety, all of that, and pulled it all into one program. And so we're gonna give you one little tool from that and that's diaphragmatic breathing. Go ahead to the next screen. And then we'll just keep it right here. Right. Yeah, I'm on. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for saying all those nice things. Um, it, that was a, pro, a project or a process of being ADHD before they had a name for it. Anyway. So thank you all for staying kind of awake. What I'm gonna do right now is a breath work. I, I usually have a long time to explain some history. You're not gonna know about that. But diaphragmatic breathing and mindfulness has been around for thousands of years. 
And just lately in the last 15 years, especially the last 10 years, that we found people like Wim Hof. Anybody heard of Wim Hof, the Iceman? Really? A couple of you have. Uh, history on him, Niraj 98 from Soma Meditation. I want you to keep track of these because I want you to look these up on YouTube after this. They're great resources. Wim Hof, W I M H O F, uh, on YouTube. Look up Soma Meditation, S O M as in monkey, A, Soma Meditation. Uh, and uh, last but not least, Dr. Joe Dispenza. These are guys that have trained us over the last 10 or 11 years. And, uh, but just a little bit about, uh, about Wim Hof so they can understand the importance to it. He has uh, over 20 Guinness World Records. There's known as the Iceman, so the records. He swam, he swam uh, for 80 meters, which in America, it's about 250 feet, right? Under three foot of ice with no gear on. It's that guy, you may have heard about him. Uh, he climbed Mount Everest in shorts and shoes. He has a world record for being immersed up to ice water to his, uh, about an hour and 57 minutes. Why keep in his core temperature? On and on and on. But something that really, uh, that really divided him from everybody else was a, uh, a research company injected a pathogen into his blood system. And up to 6,000 people before that had a reaction of temperature, nausea, uh, uh, keto storm, inflammation, all the things. They injected into him. He did his little breath thing that I'm going to teach you. And all of a sudden, the metrics went like nothing happened to him. And then he said, well, you're, you're an outlier. And Wim, being the comical guy that he is, and I got to meet him, by the way, when I went through his training. He said, no, I'm a freak. I know that. He says, but I can take guys and give me 10 days. I'll bring them back. So they gave him two dozen guys. He brought them back in four days. And you know the rest of the story, don't you? All four, all all of them could do the same thing. So I want to teach you that today, okay? And uh, I'll just tell you that we'll get comfortable here. Take that, because I don't need this. Get out my, put that anywhere. And um, <clears throat> my long hair is my penance for being judgmental the first 60 years of being a cowboy. So um, you ready? Okay. So what I'm gonna ask you to do is get in a very comfortable place if, uh, if you feel like you want to be involved in this thing. Uh, and as it, are, are any of you meditators at all? Some kind of, right? Yeah, if you know Wim Hof, you definitely are a meditator by now. So I want you to get to a place where your back supported. When we do this, we actually do it lying down. If you want to lay down, it's fine. But um, we want to where your back supported because you're going to get so relaxed afternoon. Some of you are about ready to fall asleep anyway. I'm going to help you with that. Because uh, what we want you to do to get in a very mindful place a place where anxiety and, and depression is not running your life right now, okay? And the more we do that, the more we linger, the more we launder ourselves into where we feel like that more often of our time. What happens when you're in the middle of this, your immunity goes up, your blood pH goes more alkaline. Uh, I can go on and on about what happens. It's the most uh, efficient time or most efficient moment you'll have in your life when you get into this. So we're going to do, uh, just to show you, we're going to run you through 20 breaths, and then I'm going to let you do 50 breaths, okay? But these breaths are diaphragmatic, and they're very important how you do it. So we find out that when babies breathe, they breathe in their nose, naturally, and their tummies right here expand up. Little tummies rise up and down. So I want you to take one hand, put it on your chest. The other hand, put it right in front of your belly button. And if you're with somebody that uh, you're okay being judged by, uh, look at that person. And I'm going to have you breathe in your nose and let it fall out your mouth. Breathe in your nose and watch which hand moves the most. So breathe in. Watch that hand and breathe back out. Okay. How many of you kind of felt this top hand move? Yeah. Okay. Okay. If I was judging, there'd be a few more didn't put their hand up, okay? But, that's it. but what happens is, is as trauma happens, we, we start breathing in our mouth and we're, we have the adrenaline kick in and we breathe in our chest. And if, uh, if like the guys my age, all my buddies are on CPAPs because they've been doing that for so long, they don't breathe efficiently. All your most valuable alveoli are down here, they tell us, right? Are down here. So these little things that take the oxygen out of your lungs and put it into your blood system. And so in our fast paced life and trauma, we're out our breath, breathing in our chest, 
the most inefficient and uh, most disease caused thing you can do. So I want you to really, during this deal, I want you to really concentrate on trying to make your worst beach boy or beach girl look and expand your tummy like it's got a basketball in it. It should feel kind of uncomfortable, right? Because when you breathe, try that and breathe in your nose and make this hand pop out and then let it out your mouth relaxed. So it looks like this, right? It goes, okay. You have to do that. I can't do it for you, but I promise you, you will have a great experience if you'll do that. It'll change, it'll saturate your, your cells with oxygen that haven't been saturated in many, many years. You've removed some of the toxins, the bottom part of your diaphragm that's probably been sitting in there rotting away, all these things. And you will get lightheaded. And so uh, if you're on the top aisle there, if you start doing it, you might want to just support yourself because you will. And it's a good thing, okay? It means you're getting into your parasympathetic mode. So we're running on sympathetic. We heard Dr. Larson talk about that this morning, how we're already agitated, you know, excited, anxiety, depression, and that's what's running our life. Right now, I want, you to, I want you to be able to feel like what it feels like to be in parasympathetic, rest and recover. It's when spontaneous remission happens, when people see diseases disappear in seconds. That's the state they're in. It's an altered state, very slow brain wave. The breath alone will take you there. So. I know we're short on time, so we're going to jump right into it. Are you timing me? So we're going to do 20 breaths like that first. And I'd say it's important that you close your eyes if you feel safe so you can focus on that, right? Again, if you can find a place where you can lean back and, uh, and if you do relax. So you, you want to be able to relax. You don't want to have to worry about sitting up, okay? And make sure that everything, when you just let go, that you don't do a front flip off that top bleach or anything like that, okay? So... Uh, you're going to breathe in your nose. I'm going to do four counts in and four counts out for 20 breaths. On the 20th breath, you're going to empty all the air out of your lungs. So right now, I want you to empty all the air out of your lungs. Right now, push it out. And your body's going to tell you, don't do that. Breathe, right? Well, I want you to hold your breath for five more seconds. And I want you to be able to identify what part of your front side feels tense when you feel that panic. Hold it for five more seconds and then breathe. Feel that? So somewhere it's going to be here, here, here. So I had a person tell me one time it was up here, but it can be. So, and then breathe. So at the end of 20 breaths, I'm going to tell you to blow it out and you're going to have that same panic button. When you feel that panic going somewhere in there, I want you to soften that spot. It's like taking your fist and then letting it go. So wherever that is, I want you to just let it go and go past that because what you'll do, you'll kick yourself over into what they call soma, all right? And, and if you have to breathe, it doesn't matter. I mean, you don't plug the test or anything. I'm just telling you, once you experience this, then we're going to do a 50 breath deal. And what's going to happen is when you're saturated and you hold your breath and you make the decision that I've got all this oxygen because that old long-haired cowboy told me this is going to work. I'm going to trust him one time. And you're going to hold that breath. What will happen if you do it and relax, all the pleasure hormones are releasing your body and you'll know it. You'll have your eyes will be shut. You might see lights. You'll feel buzzing. You'll hear different tones ringing. You'll have all kinds of really cool things going on. All right. And you may not want to ever come back. That's that good. So that's the idea of what can happen. Right. Uh, so any questions so far? Let's do a 50, let's do a 20 breather. All right. And then I'll question and then we'll go on and do our 50 breather. All right. So here we go. So close your eyes. Relax, I want you to feel the pressure of where the gravity is supporting you. It might be your bottom, it might be your back, it's your back against the wall, your bottom, your feet against the ground. Pay attention to those, right? The earth is trying to pull you toward the center. And that's where we're gonna just let all anxiety and depression, tenseness go down, all right? All right, so we're gonna go in the nose, four counts, out the mouth, here we go. In the nose, two, three, four, out the mouth, two, three, Four and in, two, three, four, and out, two, three, four. In the nose, expand that tummy, and out the mouth, two, three, four. In, two, three, four, out, two, three, four, and in the nose, three, four, and out the mouth, four, and in, two, three, four, and out. If you're getting dizzy, that's a good sign, okay? In the nose, three, four, out the mouth. With that tummy just in, stretch that tummy, fill it full of air, 
and out. Two, three, four, and in. Two, three, four, and out. That's 10. And in. Two, three, four, and out. Two, three, four. In. Two, three, four, and out. Three, four. In the nose. Two, three, four. Out the mouth. Two, three, four. In. Three, four, and out. And in. And out. Five more. Make them count, okay? In. Two, three, four, and out. Two, three, four. In. Three, four, and out. Two, three, four, and in. Three, four, and out. Two, three, four. Now all the way in. Big breath in. Now all the way out. Empty all the air out of your lungs. Let it out and hold it out. We're going to let you try to hold it for 30 seconds. When you feel that panic, I want you just to go by it. And what will happen, you'll feel a little influx of the, of the really pleasure hormones. We only need you to hold it for 12 more seconds. But just practice and releasing that. What you're doing is making a more dominant parasympathetic. Three more seconds. Two, one. All right. Big breath and hold. I want you to put a big breath in. Keep your eyes closed. I want you to push the blood into your head for 10 seconds. Just 10. Push. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Relax. Keep your eyes closed if you would. You kind of kind of recover. All right. Everybody okay? All right. We're going to go 50 breaths now. And if you think that was a charge, hang on. Okay, everybody okay? Any questions? All right. We're going to go 50 breaths. Here we go. We're going to go a little faster, though. We're going to go in two counts and out four. So we're going to make our in count. What we do when we breathe in, we're actually involving our sympathetic nervous system. So a little bit of adrenaline. On a breath out, which is twice as long as a breath in, we're going to involve our parasympathetic, which is all of our dopamine, oxytocin, our pleasure hormones, right? And so we're going to spend more time out than in. And you'll, it'll change your whole way you feel. So you ready? All right. Check your body out. Find those pressure points. Release any pressure, right? Okay. Here we go. We're going to go in two counts, out four. A little quicker. And in the nose. Ready? In, two, out, two, three, four. In, two, out, two, three, four. In, two, out, two, three, four. In, two, out two, three, four, in, two, out, two, three, four, in, two, and out. Good breathing, y'all, you're good. In, two, out, two, three, four, 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 in, two, and out, two, three, four. In, two, out, two, three, four. In, two, out, two, three, four. In, two, three, four. In, two, out, two, three, four. In, two, out, two, three, four. In, two, out, two, three, four. In, two, out two, three, four, in, two, out, two, three, four, in, two, out, two, three, four, in, two, and out, two, three, four, in, two, out, two, three, four, in, two, out, two, three, four, in, two, and out, we're halfway there, and in, two, out, two, three, four, in, two, out, finish strong. Four, in, two, out, two, three, four. In, two, out, two, three, four. In, two, and out, two, three, four. 20 more, in, two, and out, two, three, four. In, two, and out, two, three, four. In, two, and out, two, three, four. In, two, out, two, three, four. In, two, out, two, three, four. In, two, out, two, three.
three, four, in, two, out, two, three, four, in, two, out, two, three, four, in, two, and out, two, three, four, in, two, and out, two, three, ten more, in, two, out, two, three, four, in, two, out, two, three, four, in, two, out, finish strong, y'all, four, in, two, out, two, three, four, in, try to stay awake, and out, two, three, four, in, two, out, two, three, four, in, and out, two, three more, in, big ones, and out, three, four, and in, and out, now one big one in, and all the way out, and trust yourself, let all the air out of your lungs, take your tongue and put it in the roof of your mouth, and lock it, now you're going to feel that panic when you're sympathetic, right, you're going to relax right through it, when that happens, you'll feel things. Pay attention. Look at the lights going off behind your eyes. Feel the buzzing. Just feel the power of that weight against the ground and relax. The more you relax, the more parasympathetic dominant you will get. It's the same thing we will learn to do when we're trying to deal with life. Instead of going to that fight or flight mode, we'll go with that rest and recover. You're, all, you're already 40 seconds. That's awesome. We're going to try to go for a minute and a half. If you have to breathe, take a quick one in and out. If you have to, some of you are really holding well. I'm going to give you a chance to hold it for a minute and a half. You're almost on a minute, but don't give up. Just take a breath in and out. Keep your eyes closed and you go right back into this sensation. All right. There's a minute. If you have to breathe, it's called an injection breath. Just go back out. It'll send you right back into the mode where you left off. It's called Soma. All right. We got about 15 more seconds to make a minute and a half. The idea is feel the power in holding. That's where your power comes from. It's building that, that parasympathetic up. There's a minute, four more seconds, you'll have a minute and a half. Some of you are still holding. It's awesome. All right. Big breath, everyone. Take a big, deep breath and hold it high. Clench your fist and push the blood into your head for 10 seconds without busting any vessels, okay? 10, push, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, breathe. Keep your eyes closed. Breathe in your nose and out your nose, okay? And I just want you to relax everything in your body now. Just breathe in your nose, out, continue. Keep that breath low in your stomach. Stretch it out like you're blowing that basketball up behind your belly button. And on your own, after two or three breaths, let your air out and you hold it on your own. And as you're holding it, you're again, you're exercising that parasympathetic. It's called hypoxic training. One of the most efficient things you can do to start to train how you train, how you react to life, how you react to anything. Very few times is there ever a saber-toothed tiger approaching us, but the old tricks of our sympathetic make us think that it's there and we, we activate that system. So right now, just breathe in and out and breathe out, hold it on your own, feel that powerful parasympathetic, how powerful it can be, right? And when you can't hold it more, do two or three more breaths, let it out and practice doing that. So you get really good. So the next time you're driving down Main Street and somebody cuts you off and you want to catch up to them and cut them off, remember, right? take that breath. Let the other brain run your life. You get a long life of happiness and joy, the most intelligence of your highest immunity. When you breathe in your nose, by the way, you're increasing your nitric oxide. Studies from University of Utah and out of Canada now say that nitric oxide is an antiviral, which you have it naturally in your system when you breathe in your nose. Your sinuses release nitric oxide and completely destroys viruses. And there's studies now just in the last couple of months how doing this every day actually decreases your chances of carrying any viral load of you know what. So you can look it up. I'm going to let you just come to when you want to. Thank you so much. Be blessed and breathe. Thank you. Thank you, Johnny. So as you guys are coming out of that, I'm going to just quickly wrap up because I know we're behind time. 
Um, so the power of the breath, what happens, and he didn't have a time to go into all the details of it. PTSD and depression live in the past. Fear, anxiety live in the future, but you can't breathe in the past and you can't breathe in the future. So when you use a powerful tool like the breath work, um, or you're working with horses, you have to be present because you can only breathe in the present. And that's what helps you if you can center and learn to be present with the people that are in your life, with yourself, it can help you to master some of that and to help flip that autonomic nervous system that triggers us into the fight or flight mode. Um, so again, thank you guys for the opportunity.